Hi, I'm Mark Bales, a clinical associate professor at University of Washington, Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, and chief of fracture and trauma service here at Seattle Children's Hospital. Today I'd like to uh, talk about gait disturbance and limp. Uh, I'd like to cover uh, the different types of gait disturbance and limp, how we like to assess the patient, and a differential diagnosis uh, that, that uh, we review when we're looking at uh, different types of uh, gait. What I'm going to be covering is gait disturbances and limp as a presenting problem. Uh, I'm not going to talk about abnormal gait that is associated with an already known problem in the child, and I'm not going to talk about gait uh, variation that comes with the basic physiologic torsional angulation, angular variations we see in, in young children. Toddlers and children play for a living, and therefore they're far more interested in just getting back to play than any ancillary gain. Therefore, it's very important that we assess any limp or gait disturbance in a child appropriately. One thing I'd like to bring up is that structural problems don't cause a delay in ambulation. Uh, hip dysplasia will not cause it, limb length discrepancy, club feet, flat feet, scoliosis, none of these structural problems will cause a delay in, in walking. They may be associated, uh, but underneath it all, a neuromuscular problem is going to most likely be the cause of a, of a delay in gait. Uh, structural abnormalities, again, may be present, but they're secondary. An important thing to remember. Um, in looking at basic gait development, toddlers have a wide base gait uh, classically uh, and they walk with increased flexion of their hips and knees. They spend more time in double stance than a typical adult gait pattern and they can't vary their speed with changing their stride length so they must just increase their cadence and, and that gives them the choppy gait that you often see. But by age five they begin developing a stable velocity pattern and by age seven they do have a, an adult type of gait pattern that can be equated uh, with, with normal gait. We can look at gait disturbance in a number of different ways. We can look at the longevity, we can look at the gait pattern, we can look at the age in which we're seeing the presenting problem, the location, or the category of the etiology. Uh, and all can be helpful in thinking about the child as they first come in. If we look at the longevity of gait disturbance, with the acute changes, uh, they often have a previously normal gait. Uh, they've had a clear onset or associated activity that can be uh, connected with the gait disturbance. Um, but you have to remember that, that historical observations can be flawed, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the more long-standing gait patterns, these may be uh, present since initial walking, or they may have developed uh, over a long period of time uh, till they finally hit a threshold of being um, noticed and, and brought to con um, assessment by the families or the, the primary care providers. Uh, they may have uh, delayed milestones or not, um, but they may have had an early normal gait. Uh, we can also look at uh, the long-standing gaits as being um, either unilateral or bilateral. Uh, so in other words, a limp versus a, a global abnormal gait pattern. Uh, we want to check the perinatal history carefully um, for clues. Uh, we want to look at motor milestones. Uh, was there a smooth progression of the normal milestones or did they progress to a certain point and then plateau uh, or even digress? Um, was the gait ever normal or, or never normal? Uh, and then finally, uh, does this seem to be a general problem with their movement uh, and gait, or is this a specific site that seems to be the origin? They're, they're unlikely to need urgent treatment, but they may be important to diagnose these in a timely manner uh, because uh, often these children may have a neuromuscular disorder, even a degenerative disorder, that it's good to uh, be aware of. The, uh, the acute gait changes uh, are the ones that kind of include the uh, etiologies that require urgent diagnosis and treatment. Uh, these can cover a lot of ground. It may be anything from a splinter in the foot to a malignant neoplasm, and they can be challenging assessments. Uh, as mentioned uh, before, both the child and the parent really can be poor historians. Uh, in a child, especially a young child, toddler, uh, they can be very difficult to examine uh, because they may not want to cooperate uh, either just because of their age or because they're uncomfortable. Uh, and there's a real temptation to launch into a big shotgun workup uh, where every test imaginable is thrown at them, uh, where often these problems can be assessed very effectively with a, a good history and physical uh, and, and very basic studies.
The things that need urgent identification and treatment, as we all would know, are infection, malignancies, or neural axis abnormalities. Uh, I often find it's uh, helpful to kind of approach this in a reverse engineering manner, in which the focus is finding these must-find etiologies, uh, and then once I've gotten past this, uh, then I can take my time a little bit more for some of the others. Um, Missing a diagnosis uh, at the first in onset is often not the worst thing, but there are certain ones that, that are important to diagnose early. Uh, you know, it's really only embarrassing to miss a toddler fracture or uh, the first Perthes presentation or even a hemiplegia that's subtle. Um, but it probably isn't going to cause any long-term detriment to the patient or, or, or the treatment plan. On the other hand, uh, it, there are um, delays that you know may kind of end up with a little bit of a detriment that we don't want to miss. Like like osteomyelitis, uh, some of the benign neoplasms, especially if they're in the uh, neural axis, uh, juvenile inflammatory arthropathies, hip dysplasia, and then there's the disasters, um, which are really, if they're missed and not treated appropriately, they're going to they're going to quite possibly seriously affect the child's uh, uh, health or even life. And these would be uh, slip capital femoral epiphysis, which again, if it progresses, uh, the child's never going to have a normal hip. A septic hip, obviously, is going to be destructive. Malignancies, spinal cord pathology, all these uh, really need to be diagnosed in a timely manner. Uh, we can look at it by basic etiology as well. Um, there's pain and inflammation causing limp, there's weak musculature, uh, there's unbalanced or abnormal muscle activity, joint abnormalities, uh, or in the more extreme cases, leg length differences. Uh, if we look at the gait patterns, uh, we can see uh, several different kinds. There's the antalgic gait, the Trendelenburg gait, the proximal muscle weakness gait, a spastic gait and a short limb gait. Uh, sometimes there can be a combination of these, uh, but they all can kind of be broken down into these basic five gait patterns. Antalgic gaits are characterized by pain, uh, and the limp is in an effort to minimize that pain. So they have uh, what you might think of as a quick step, a shortened stance phase to get off of the, the painful limb and back onto their non-painful limb as quickly as possible. The Trendelenburg gait, is characterized by a trunk ship over the hip during stance uh, to bring the center of gravity uh, over the hip joint and diminish the muscle uh, power uh, needed uh, and stress on the hip. Now this can be uh, due generally to functionally weak hip abductors, so there can be actual weakness in the abductors, or it may be mechanical in which there's a lever arm problem, uh, such as in coxivera or trochanteric overgrowth. Uh, in hip dysplasia, the femoral head is out of the acetabulum, so you have no fulcrum. So again, a, a mechanical issue. In a proximal muscle weakness gait, um, these are almost always underlying uh, uh, or indicate an underlying muscle or neurologic disease. Uh, you have weak hip extensors, uh, which leads to increased lordosis, and eventual Trendelenburg component comes in, so again, a, another type of gait pattern, uh, to, which is secondary to weakening abductors. You have a spastic gait, which we sometimes see as a presenting symptom, uh, especially for the, the very subtle uh, hemiplegic and uh, diplegic patients. Uh, but on exam, these will again be characterized by reproducible hypertonicity, uh, and watching them walk, they'll have an unbalanced dynamic muscle activity. These can be quite subtle. We, we see patients quite frequently uh, where the feeling is that they may have hurt themselves or some other uh, abnormality, uh, but they may have gone through their first several years of life or even further with nobody catching on to the fact that they, they actually have mild hemiplegia. Um, short leg gait is often an interesting thing because uh, this is an area where there's a lot of uh, misconception both on the standpoint of uh, parents and the public uh, as well as, as some uh, medical providers. You will get a, a, an actual change in gait pattern clinically at about 5% of limb length discrepancy, which equates to roughly a centimeter in a toddler, which is a fairly significant amount of difference uh, percentage-wise. Um, so very, very subtle differences in gait, such as you know a, a few millimeters, uh, aren't going to cause a gait disturbance a, at all. Um, a level pelvis is the real goal uh, you know, for uh, a normal gait. And for compensation of a limb length discrepancy, the, the 
motor center is very, very well um, compensated by toe walking on the short side, um, using a little bit of he and hip and knee flexion on the long side, and it can be extremely difficult to detect. And in a long, uh, long pants or, or a, a long skirt or dress where you can't clearly see the legs, you, you won't see these little effects. Basically, uh, gait studies have shown that you can normalize mechanical work, again, using compensation measures up to about 5% until the gait actually changes. Uh, in assessing uh, the uh, gait uh, disturbance or a limp, I think you can approach this systematically. You can look at it uh, in your mind. You can think of the basic etiologies. You can think of congenital, uh, which includes the, the, many of the hip dysplasias, PFD, uh, CP, uh, which is a static uh, condition, usually from, from birth or early on, <coughs> excuse me, or neural axis abnormalities, um, such as diastem atomyelia or tethered cord. There can be developmental problems such as perthes, uh, slip capital femoral epiphysis, and transient synovitis, uh, trauma, which can include fractures, osteochondral defects. Uh, infection, septic joints, osteomyelitis, uh, SI inflammation or infection, and spine infections. Uh, tumors uh, can either be benign or malignant. Uh, typically uh, in the musculoskeletal system we see osteoid osteomas, sometimes cysts. Uh, in malignant tumors they can be either primary uh, or blood tumors such as leukemia. About 20 percent of uh, leukemia patients are actually discovered through musculoskeletal uh, presenting complaints. Uh, or finally, the systematic uh, conditions such as the juvenile inf inflammatory diseases, myopathies, myelopathies, uh, all fall into that category. Um, again, I think it's helpful to look at it uh, in your history, determining whether this is an acute change or is this a long standing gait disturbance? Is it painful or is it non painful? Uh, and is this a limp or is it a global gait disturbance? That can often get you at least into the basic category of your etiology. For the history, again, we want to know about pain, uh, how long it's been going on, location, uh, any, any perceived associated or injury or activity, um, whether uh, they're limping or they're actually not walking at all. Uh, and other changes in the exam, such as skin neurologic changes, uh, their back um, uh, exam, uh, and whether they're having pain at rest and pain at night, the usual type of things. Some of the red herrings that can kind of come up that, that can lead you a little bit astray uh, is a history of trauma, because uh, if you ask hard enough, trauma is almost always present. Uh, you know, kids get hurt for a living. Uh, there's always bumps and bruises, and somebody, either the child themselves or the parents, remember something, but it, it may be just coincidental. Um, so you can't always rely on, on a specific trauma history. Um, Location, again, can sometimes be a little tricky. In the, in the young infant or the toddler, they can't tell you at all. Um, and even in the older child, uh, or coming from the parent's standpoint, uh, the area of the pain may be a little bit different than the actual pathology. And classically, it's the, the thigh or knee pain indicating uh, hip pathology. Uh, I, fever is another one of those issues that uh, the lack of a fever does not really tell you that you don't have an infection or a, a significant uh, inflammatory problem. Uh, many of these will be uh, afebrile, um, so it's good to know that they do have a fever, but on the other hand, lack of fever doesn't take infection out of your, your differential. One of our classic pitfall problems uh, is the uh, history of a, a groin pull uh, or any sprain in general. Uh, these, are, these are less common in young children, uh, even fairly uncommon in, in adolescence, and a groin pull it classically ends up being a slip capital femoral epiphysis uh, many of the times if it's not appropriately assessed. The exam uh, again, covers most of the, the, the general type of musculoskeletal exam you, would, you typically would do. Uh, again, are they walking? Uh, is it a limp versus general gait abnormality? Uh, this is the time to check for limb length discrepancy. You want to kind of look at the overall symmetry of the lower extremities, the, the thighs and the calves uh, musculature development comparatively. You want to look at the feet, uh, see if they're typical plantar grade feet. Uh, you especially want to look for the possibility of a high arch foot, which is uh, often a sign that there might be a neural axis abnormality. 
Uh, you uh, look at skin for rash or skin changes, swelling, range of motion, uh, palpate for soft tissue mass and focal tenderness. And finally, again, don't forget the back when, it, when you're assessing gait disturbance or limp uh, because back, various spinal or back pathologies can present as a limp or a gait disturbance or even refusal to walk. Uh, classically, in the, in the toddler, uh, refusal to walk may actually be a discitis. Uh, I think it's important to kind of listen to wh how listen to your your feelings about the patient. If, if the patient doesn't seem right to you, they probably aren't. And conversely, if they otherwise look great, other than their one focal area, they probably don't really have one of the bad things. Uh, the uh, toddler and the child can be difficult, as everybody who uh, works with these type of patients knows. Uh, you want to have as calm of an environment as possible. Uh, you, it, while you're taking your history and talking with the parents, um, you want to keep one eye out for their general activity. Uh, look at how they're using their upper extremities, because uh, again, this can be a tip-off to a neurologic disorder. Uh, and their general motor planning and their, and their, their gait as they move around, if they're, if they're moving around. Um, once you begin actually examining the child, uh, a form of misdirection is often uh, uh, helpful. Uh, you begin away from where you suspect the source might be uh, and gain, gain the confidence of the child, examining things that, that clearly aren't going to hurt. Um, and then you work your way towards the area of concern. Um, when you're doing your range of motion, you want to make sure you're isolating each joint. If you simply uh, grab the leg by the calf and, and start moving around, you're actually moving the ankle, knee, and hip joints. Um, so you want to make sure you stop and, and move each of those joints separately. Uh, otherwise, you get fooled um, as to where they're actually tender. Focal tenderness is, is really helpful. If, if, you're getting, if you have a cooperative child um, where you can at least read their facial expressions, um, being very careful and, f and, and pressing systematically from foot all the way up to hip um, will often kind of reveal things that aren't quite as uh, obvious on the more general exams. Um, so it's important to take the time to really kind of palpate carefully in a systematic member, a systematic way. Uh, if the patients are ambulating, watch them walk over several passes. Um, uh, that gives you a chance to kind of look at each level, uh, from ankle to knee to, to hip and, and, and back. Uh, from a screening standpoint, you can have them run, hop, uh, get up from the floor, um, all the things that uh, you know, help you look to see if there's some muscle dysfunction. Uh, so when we're looking at testing, what's a reasonable initial evaluation beyond your, your history and physical? I think it's, it's reasonable to always consider obtaining a set of plain x-rays. Uh, you always want to make sure you have two views uh, that are orthogonal to each other, in other words, 90 degrees. Um, basic blood work, I, I think, is an appropriate thing on, on a first exam, uh, unless something is clearly obvious uh, um, during your history and physical. Um, the other test um, sometimes can be helpful, but other but but can often be put off past the first visit. Um, for blood work, I think the ones that are are good initial screening are CBC with a differential. Remember, with infection, white counts can be normal. You want to look for the shift. Uh, inflammatory markers are very helpful for looking at uh, many of the inflammatory and infectious etiologies. Sedimentation rate is sensitive, uh, but it's slow to react and not very specific. Uh, we find that the C-reactive protein uh, is also very sensitive, much faster to change, uh, both, both with the, the onset of the condition and with your treatment. Uh, and it's more, more specific to infection, so it helps from that standpoint. Uh, some time ago, uh, uh, Coker described criteria for looking at septic hips and described four uh, areas that uh, were a history of fever, non-weight bearing, a white count over 12,000, a sedimentation rate of 40 percent, and this had progressively larger percentages of, of indication of a, a septic hip uh, by the time you got down to four predictors. Uh, other people have not found quite as tight of correlation as this, and uh, we, we tend to use the C-reactor protein now quite a bit more, but this is a good baseline um, for considering a, a septic hip, which is one of the emergencies to uh, develop, to uh, identify uh, and treat uh, when you see these patients. As I mentioned, we always want to get two views uh, on an x-ray. Uh, we want to look for 
cortical disruption, uh, any medullary or trabecular change, and periosteal reactions. But remember, it takes about seven to 10 days for a plain x-ray to change with a pathologic process. So if you're seeing the patient within the first few days of their symptoms, your plain x-rays are very often gonna be normal. You'll sometimes see some soft tissue changes. Uh, they may even occur before the bone changes, uh, but they're, they're more subtle and uh, difficult to interpret. I, with x-rays, the younger patients uh, have less bone development as much of their uh, end of their long bones and around their joints are still cartilage uh, and, and obviously can't be seen on a regular x-ray. There are ossification variants that unless you are frequently looking at children's x-rays, it can be difficult to interpret. Uh, and sometimes the radiologists even have trouble with this. Um, a contralateral view can be helpful if you need to match things up, um, especially in a trauma situation. Uh, as I mentioned, changes in uh, a regular x-ray for infection take seven to 10 uh, days usually to develop. Um, in this case of a hip, by the time the hip appears different, it's probably likely permanently damaged. Uh, so clearly you don't want to wait uh, long enough for x-rays to change for that. Um, the neoplasms, again, can take a long time to develop obvious x-ray signs. Uh, and it's uh, better to identify them uh, earlier. Um, subtle fractures, like a toddler fracture may not be seen acutely either, but again, this kind of falls in a different category of, of uh, diagnoses that aren't quite as critical to make right away. Um, one thing, again, to remember is that children rarely have sprains. Uh, uh, they do get them. It's not 100% no sprains, but uh, it's definitely one of those things you should be thinking of other etiologies uh, such as subtle trauma, early infections, or neoplasms. Um, ultrasound, uh, if it's available, is useful for fluid collections. Uh, it is more available in some of the other imaging modalities. Uh, you can usually get it on fairly short notice. It has the advantage of not having any radiation. Uh, but the one problem is it really cannot separate uh, infectious fluid from just a simple effusion in the joint. Uh, bone scans these days are less uh, frequently used, but they are quite good for uh, uh, identification for a process in bone and joints, uh, not so much. Uh, they're very sensitive, but they're not specific at all. Uh, they still certainly have a role. Um, they're helpful in polyostotic conditions, uh, and they're helpful in situations where it's really unclear where the location might be uh, and help you localize for further assessment. CT scans uh, are very good for anatomic delineation and confirmation of certain uh, suspected or, or even identified pathologies, but they have the disadvantage of high radiation. Um, it's often useful for conditions like tarsal coalition, osteodiastoma, uh, and spondylolysis assessment. MRIs, the, the biggest problem here is that they're expensive. They're not readily available everywhere. Uh, there are logistical challenges, such as the need for sedation in younger children. Uh, often you can't get access to the MRI on an urgent basis, so you have a delay sometimes in your, your diagnosis. They're clearly overutilized, uh, at least here in the, the US, um, because there's so many of them. Uh, very often you, you can make the diagnosis with an H&P and much more basic tests. Um, MRIs really, uh, many times, don't really add any advantage to the prognosis or the management. Um, and they certainly shouldn't be the initial test of choice in, in most situations. Uh, having said that, they are excellent imaging for multiple tissues within a limited area. So you'll not only see activity within bone, uh, but you can see the soft tissues, you can see the structures of the neural axis, so it can be very helpful in certain situations. Uh, for subtle early changes, uh, such as again in neoplasma infection, they will see, they will show you changes much quicker uh, uh, than an X-ray will, and that's where we use them. So if we look at things by years, um, in the first few years of life, uh, if we divide gait disturbance into non-painful and painful etiologies. Uh, for the non-painful ones, the most common things you should have in your back of your mind are hip dysplasia, uh, dislocated hip, uh, limb length discrepancies, 
various types of proximal femoral uh, variants, uh, subtle cerebral palsy, uh, most, most likely hemiplegia, but occasionally diplegia, uh, neural axis abnormalities, uh, mostly the dysraphic variants that can be subtle. Uh, and towards the end of the, this age range, uh, muscular dystrophy, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, starts uh, showing uh, uh, changes in gait that uh, initially had normal development. Painful, the shift is to uh, in, uh, infectious and uh, neoplastic process for the most part, but you see septic arthritis and osteomyelitis. Uh, you will see this is the age range where they get toddler fractures. Discitis, as I mentioned, kind of comes in. Uh, the, uh, the posse articular type of GIA uh, type conditions uh, start appearing at two to three years of age. And then finally, uh, remember, uh, neoplasms do come up uh, in this age range. Leukemia and neuroblastoma are the ones that you're, you're thinking about the most. Uh, but they can, again, have their initial presenting symptoms in the musculoskeletal system. In a little older child, uh, for non-painful, Again, limb length discrepancy sometimes is, is not seen until this age, uh, um, uh, even though it may have been present. Uh, we unfortunately still see late diagnosed hip dysplasia. Uh, this is maybe one of a little bit more common age to identify the subtle hemiplegias. And by now, again, some of the, the neuromuscular disorders start uh, appearing. Uh, painful, much the same list. Uh, we now add transient cytovitis and perthes uh, to the list of things we often have to sort through. Um, osteochondral defects, uh, more commonly in the knee and ankle, um, uh, begin to show up. Uh, again, the inflammatory conditions, uh, subtle physeal injuries. Uh, uh, some of the children are becoming much more active and involved in organized sports, and we start seeing stress fractures and overuse injuries. Uh, and finally, tarsal coalitions often become symptomatic at, uh, towards the tail end of this age range. And finally, in the adolescent, uh, I, we still, again, sometimes make initial uh, diagnosis of limb length discrepancies. Sometimes now we're seeing the residual of early hip pathology, so subtle DDH that uh, either may, may have or have not been identified in infancy or childhood uh, if it can sometimes now start becoming um, symptomatic with, with uh, sports and other activities. Uh, Sometimes we'll see congenital uh, dislocation of patella uh, fairly late. And again, the progressive neuropathies and myopathies sometimes come up a little bit later. Uh, the big one in this age range that uh, in the hip area and uh, for thigh and knee pain as well is to consider and, and rule out or identify slip capital femoral epiphysis. Uh, and the rest of these are similar to the other age uh, ranges. I, some of the, the pitfall problems that, that again you, that may lead you astray at first uh, are a diagnosis of a sprain. Um, looking at a child uh, with a limp uh, or a gait abnormality and simply say they're walking like a toddler. Um, I, neural axis pathology uh, again can be subtle and, and you need a, a careful physical exam. Um, remember that trauma can be a red herring. Um, uh, Maybe another condition with just a, a coincidental trauma uh, history along with it. Um, uh, we continue to see slip capital femoral epiphysis identified late because they're chalked up to being sports overuse injuries or groin pulls. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, pitfalls is to just simply not keep following up uh, these patients until you have a definitive diagnosis or the, the problem resolves. Uh, I like to see patients every three to six weeks. Um, uh, once, uh, unless um, I've already identified something. So in summary, uh, limp and gait disturbance is a common problem. I think it needs to be taken seriously and all children carefully assessed. The assessment needs to be done in a, in a systematic way and that often a good history and physical and very simple tests can lead to a diagnosis and appropriate treatment. Thank you for watching.